Population Viability Analysis, or PVA, assesses the viability of a population by identifying the threats faced by a species. PVAs began life as an attempt to answer the question, how large must a population be for it to have a reasonable chance of survival for a reasonably long time? A reasonable chance of survival was often taken as 95%, and a reasonably long period of time was often taken to be 100 years. They are used to investigate how different factors impact the overall extinction risk and predict how likely extinction actually is. They are also often used to investigate how different human sources can affect habitats and predator-prey relationships of different species, such as polar bears, toads, and fish. Population viability analyses earlier in life were used to identify the smallest population that would have a reasonable chance of survival for a reasonably long period of time, the minimum viable population size. Though assessing the viability of a population is far from easy, estimating a minimum viable population can be a useful exercise because it crystallizes several other ideas. It identifies the population as the critical unit for conservation purposes. Until about 25 years ago, conservationists tended to focus only on protecting land, not on managing the populations of plants and animals that occur there. The term viability stresses that we're concerned with the persistence of the populations over some reasonably long period of time. Furthermore, it emphasizes that we're interested in the prospects that the population can be self-sustaining. Maintaining a population's viability is a fundamental goal of conservation biology for many different reasons. Not only is there intrinsic value in keeping up certain animal and plant populations, but there is also the aspect that the role in the structure and function of ecological communities is extremely important. They also have an economic or an aesthetic value in many purposes, such as ecotourism. Also, let's not forget that there are key environmental laws that mandate maintaining the viability of populations. The National Forest Management Act of 1976 mandates that viable populations of all native vertebrates be maintained in our national forest. The Endangered Species Act of 1978 provides a means whereby the ecosystems upon which endangered species and threatened species depend may be conserved. The management goals based on the principles underlying population viability analyses are numerous. Firstly, we want to maintain genetic variability and manage populations so that we can maintain both the viability and adaptivity of these populations. Secondly, we want to maintain viability through an ecological timescale. Lastly, we want to maintain the potential for continuing adaptation over evolutionary timescale needs. Large populations are more likely to last longer than small populations for two main reasons. The first is demographic stochasticity. This refers to the random variation in sex ratios, birth rates, and death rates that can affect populations over time. The second is environmental stochasticity. This means the unpredictable variation in environment that causes population change. For example, rain, temperature, storms, and disease are all less likely to eliminate large populations than they are small populations. There is a greater chance that some individuals will be able to survive in the large populations. With natural variations in population, it is less likely that variations of population over time will result in extinction of large populations as compared to small populations. Population viability analyses combine field studies and population modeling to predict the probability of extinction after so many years. 
Analyses can be done in either complex or more simplistic models. Complex models need more data, and bad quality data may creates bad quality results. However, it can be more specific in certain cases. There are two different ways in which models relate the way time is treated as a variable. The first, discrete, measures time in finite steps, typically of equal length. In the second, continuous, time is treated as a continuous variable. In these equations, n is population size, n sub t is population size at time t, and lambda is the discrete or finite growth rate. The natural log of lambda, or r, equals the intrinsic growth rate, or instantaneous growth rate. Focusing on discrete models that involve simulation, there are two simple models of population growth, exponential and logarithmic. To create a population projection, at the very least, you need population growth rate and population size. If lambda is greater than 1, the population is increasing. If it is equal to 1, the population is stable, and if it is less than 1, the population is decreasing. There are two ways to identify the mean, arithmetic and geometric. You use a geometric mean when the thing you are averaging is multiplicative. The geometric mean is always less than the arithmetic mean. In addition, the population may decline over the long term even if the arithmetic mean is greater than 1. One type of growth, exponential, is not sustainable and you would only really see it in such circumstances as species being introduced to a new environment. Logarithmic growth, on the other hand, has limits to its population growth built in. This would occur in circumstances such as the growth rate being densely dependent, and the growth gets smaller as the population, n, gets larger. In this equation, k is the population size at which growth is zero, and r sub zero is the maximum per capita growth rate. Another type of population model is age-structured, in which individuals are partitioned into age classes. In this, it is assumed that fecundities and survival are related to age. To analyze some models, you need to estimate population parameters. One such is survival. S sub i equals the survival from age class i to i plus 1. N sub i t is the number of age class i at time t. N sub i plus 1 and t plus 1 equals the number in age class i plus 1 at the time t plus 1. Another such population parameter is fecundity. F sub rep is the fecundity of individuals in a reproductive age class. N sub 0 t plus 1 is the number of individuals in an age class 0 at time t plus 1. N sub rep t is the number of reproductives at time t. However, all of these calculations are useless if we do not apply them to the real world. A PVA was recently conducted for the endangered Fender's Blue Butterfly with the goal of providing additional information to the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, which was developing a recovery plan for the species. Defenders Blue is located mainly in the Willamette Valley of Oregon State. The study concluded that the Fender's blue butterfly was at even more of a risk than previously thought. The minimum annual population growth rate must be kept higher than at levels typically considered acceptable for other species. It also identified key areas where recovery efforts should be focused. Because butterfly populations vary so widely from year to year, the first PPA ever conducted was done on grizzly bears, who have been reduced to less than 2% of their former geographic range. They have been on the endangered species list since 1975, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a comprehensive recovery plan. Though still extremely limited, the grizzly bear population has recovered since the 1970s. Today, there is a 99.2% chance that the grizzly bear population will persist for 100 years. 500 years out, there is a 96.2% chance that the population will persist. Going from insects to mammals and now to birds, 
The Northern Spotted Owl is the last animal we will be looking at on the endangered species list. It inhabits areas of Northern California, Oregon, Washington State, and a small section of Southern Canada. Throughout its range, it is closely associated with old, dense, large diameter forest stands that provide forage, cover, and suitable nest sites. The populations of northern spotted owls will continue to decline if their habitat continues to become less common. However, at some point, the amount of habitat remaining, even at this point, will be insufficient to support a self-sustaining wild population. This brings up a very interesting dilemma. Should forest management practices be changed, even if there is no guarantee that the population can be saved at all? These are just three examples of how population viability analyses can and have helped populations. However, they are not and cannot be the be-all end-all of all conservation analyses and projections. We hope this taught you more about population viability analysis. Learn more about current conservation biology topics. Check out our other lectures.